Welcome to another episode of the Vetting Process. Today, I'm here with uh, Michael Ushmerick, who is running for state representative here in the, the Worcester County area. It's great to have you here. Josh, thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, thrilled to have this opportunity. Uh, so would you like to tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Sure, absolutely. So uh, right now I'm the uh, Fitchburg City Council uh, president, uh, a position I've held for the past five years. And I've been a, a Fitchburg City Council uh, counselor now for, uh, for seven years. And uh, I didn't grow up in Fitchburg. I grew up uh, on, the, on the North Shore uh, of Massachusetts and uh, moved out to Fitchburg uh, about, just about 20 years ago uh, for college. And uh, what I thought would be a, a fairly brief four-year stay uh, really turned into, uh, into my new home. And uh, you know, I, I, I came for an education uh, and I, I certainly got that, uh, but I got so much more. You know, I met my wife in Fitchburg um, and, uh, and some of the landmark and, and best things that have happened in my life have happened right here in the city of Fitchburg. Uh, and, and so, uh, it was certainly a desire for me to, uh, to stay. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I, I don't, uh, want to wait to have a family and to have an established career, uh, and to, to start complaining about what's happening around me. And I think we all have ideas of what we think could be better for our, for our towns and our municipalities. Uh, and, you know, I started making phone calls about how I could get better involved. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was running for uh, for, a, <laughs> for a Ward 4 counselor, uh, representing uh, Fitchburg State and the downtown area of, uh, of Fitchburg. And uh, I won through a, a three-way primary and then won in the general election and, uh, and joined the city council at age 25. Um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was certainly uh, quite a journey. And, you know, I'll share that uh, this type of path was far from a foregone conclusion for me. Um, you know, I, I grew up on welfare and food stamps and the youngest of five. Um, and, uh, it was, it was a, a fairly hard upbringing and, um, you know, by age 17, I was a high school dropout and, you know, my life was headed in, in a couple of different paths and I was fortunate enough, um, because of some wonderful advocates um, and some folks that really saw some potential in me, uh, particularly those at Fitchburg State, uh, that took a chance on me and really helped me uh, develop myself personally uh, and really develop the infancy stages of my, my education and my career. And, um, you know, I've heard some describe it as, well, that's the American dream, right? You're picking yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, and while that's a, a way of looking at it, I suppose, um, you know, I would say it came down to more luck and that idea of bootstrapping in America is more myth than reality these days that, um, short of a few fortunate breaks and, and some luck, my dream doesn't happen nine times out of 10, you know, that, that story came down to luck. And, and the whole reason I'm running for state representative right now is because I believe that it shouldn't come down to luck, uh, that we need to do more, uh, as a as a state government to ensure that everyone has that same chance that I had to grow up in a working class family, make it solidly into the middle class and to be able to pursue your dream, whether it's an elected service or in higher education that I do uh, the career I work in by day um, or any other uh, career path uh, where you start in life and the zip code that you're born in shouldn't predetermine the outcome. And um, and I think there's a lot we can do uh, at, at the state government level. Uh, to ensure uh, that we open up those opportunities and those pathways for everyone. Absolutely. And your story is such an encouraging one to be able to come to Fitchburg and like claim, like find it as your new home and be able to, you know, run for office there. And now you're running for state rep. So you've definitely, uh, and something you talked about a little bit there uh, was what like initially got you into the world of politics and how you decide to be Completely active. Um. Yeah, I, you know, I uh, my first interest whatsoever in politics uh, was in middle school. My uh, while well, my brother, my oldest brother, um, Derek, was uh, was a, a senior at Suffolk, and he was interning uh, with the McCain presidential campaign in the year two thousand. And uh, and so my brother had this incredible opportunity. Uh, along the Straight Talk Express back then um, 
and, uh, and, and John McCain's kind of improbable rise um, in, in early 2000, and ultimately what ended in, in, in a loss to uh, uh, into eventually President uh, Bush's uh, presidential run. Uh, but my brother was able to follow uh, Senator McCain all the way through um, to the, uh, the Republican National Convention. And we grew up in a house of you know, working class union Democrats. Um, and it was, it was kind of a taboo subject for my brother um, to be uh, campaigning with a Republican. Uh, but uh, I think he, along with I, were enamored with um, someone who was a bit of a political maverick, someone who was willing to say, I don't care which side of the fence this is on. I don't care whether it's right or left, Republican or Democrat. I care about, is this the right move for America? Is this the right move for the people I, I represent? Uh, and if it means working with, you know, Ted Kennedy on the exact opposite end of the political spectrum, then so be it. That's what I'll do. And for me, that really spoke to me as uh, there's hope in politics that this gridlock and this partisanism that I saw developing even as a, you know, what, a 12 or 13 year old back in the year 2000, that I was really struck by maybe there is hope uh, that politics won't always just be us versus them. Uh, that there'll be these opportunities and these moments to coalesce around common goals and a common vision. And, uh, you know, I, I can't say that I did anything more in politics from 2000 through maybe, you know, my early years in college. Um, and so for probably about six to eight years, you know, it did nothing other than really pique my interest. And I started watching the news and I started reading, you know, multiple newspapers and looking at politics and international affairs um, from other press outlets. So uh, that was really my first, uh, my first foray into politics. Um, and it really wasn't until I, I um, it was later on in my time at Pittsburgh State uh, University that I, I really, because of some of my professors, really started to develop a love and a passion for both domestic and international politics. Um, and uh, and it, was, it wasn't until I uh, really decided consciously that Pittsburgh would be my home uh, long term for, for my wife, Carissa, and I, uh, that um, I realized, you know, that local politics and state politics play such a huge role in our everyday lives. And, and that, that was the moment. John Hay was such an inspirational figure to many people, both Democrat and Republican. For reasons you mentioned, he didn't care if something was a Democratic view or a Republican view, he just had to write. I, I wish we had more like it in today's politics at a national level, uh, but he, he certainly, you know, and I didn't agree with him on every stance, and I, I think very few people did, Republicans and Democrats alike. Um, it, it was usually something you could argue uh, with him about, but I think that was the point. He wanted you to argue about it, and he wanted to have that discourse, and that discourse brings people together. And so I, I, uh, I, I hope that I fashioned myself in some of that same spirit uh, that he had. And I certainly hope for the sake of our country and our commonwealth that there are many more state and federal figures that model themselves in that same brand of politics. Absolutely. Um, my next question here is, um, so uh, sort of the elephant in the room for the past few months has been this pandemic that we're in. I'm curious as someone who's running for state rep, someone who's, who's in the city council, how has the pandemic affected your work? Absolutely. So I, the obvious uh, or, or the, the, I guess, the most visual aspect of, of how it's affected us is we can no longer be in the same room together. Uh, we're governing without seeing each other. And, uh, you know, in early March, I believe we held our last city council meeting in person. And we did so in a uh, kind of a, a quasi distance form. We did it at the FATV studios for the first time amid the uncertainty and realizing perhaps we can't be open to the public, perhaps it's not the best idea to be meeting in a school. Uh, so we do so in a socially distant manner in the FATV studios. And within a week, we realized we wouldn't be able to repeat that either, that we were, as, as counselors, both a danger to our, um, uh, our fellow counselors and our colleagues, as well as to those in the studio, that we, the studio we were using for FATV. So it certainly changed how uh, we met, how we governed, um, and you know, we, we very quickly had to adopt new technology and we meet on Zoom just like this, uh, uh, you know, with incredible security protocol to ensure that we don't 
uh, fall victim to any of, you know, hacking or, or Zoom bombing. And uh, so it's, it's, I guess, changed accessibility in some, uh, in some ways. Uh, you know, the ability to be able to show up as a resident uh, to the doorstep of government and, and speak at a city council meeting have changed and that you physically can't be there. But I think we've tried to adopt and embrace uh, technology so that uh, we can become more accessible so that residents can call their public comment in and we'll have it read. Uh, I'll read it at the top of the meeting that they can submit it by email, we'll enter it into the record or that they can uh, they can join us via Zoom and they can sign up uh, to, to join us. Uh, and so I think in some ways, before you had to physically be present, you had to schedule yourself, you had to physically drive there, you, you know, you had to, you know, uh, God forbid, if you, if you had uh, a, a disability, um, you know, the, the challenges of physically getting to be present in that room could, could be an arduous task. And now you can do it from the comfort of your, of your living room. Uh, so I, I, I'm excited about the level of accessibility and I'm, I'm already looking at how can we ensure that we don't take a step backwards from where we are now. Uh, in terms of collaborating and working together, that's the, the positive part as a city councilor. I don't think that's changed. We, we contact each other, you know, by phone um, and, and we, you know, we still talk to each other and share ideas. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, we're still working actively with our partners, you know, on, under the mayor's executive team and uh, ensuring that, you know, there's no communication gap uh, between, you know, the mayor, his administration and, and the council in making their decision. And hopefully that there's no communication gap with us in the public. Um, so uh, while it's been disruptive um, uh, in terms of the logistics of how we meet, I think we're still able to accomplish the same end product. Certainly the nature of what we're talking about has shifted dramatically of, you know, we're concerned about the budgetary implications. We've had to do emergency orders um, in, in finance uh, funding for uh, keeping some of our departments better funded who need to buy PPE and adapt uh, daily to the changing uh, circumstances out in, in public and with the public health situation. Uh, but then we're also allocating funding to keep businesses afloat um, and, and to keep the crucial parts of our economy, those small and mid-sized businesses that really rely on large um, commercial uh, and, and you know uh, business traffic day in and day out, they're they're suffering, and so that's where we've needed to allocate some of our emergency funding, a large part of which has come from the federal and state government to us. Uh, and and then you know the third part is our nonprofit partners, uh, many of whom are also struggling. Uh, they rely on philanthropy uh, and grant funding uh, to sustain themselves, and and often some fee for service they're hurting as well. And so we're trying to ensure that um, the critical service that they provide to our community, that there's continuity there in their operations and that no one in our community goes without the services that they've come to, to count on. So um, that aspect of it has been, um, has been a challenge. Uh, and, and I think we're, we're continuously trying to find new ways to, to rise to the occasion. And I think it's great that like Fitchburg and Lemonster were relatively like pretty quick in adapting to these new ways and not trying to stick with what was already happening and realizing this was an issue? Absolutely. I think you just hit it on the head too. I think, you know, the idea of collaborating between municipalities and sharing an exchange of information between Fitchburg, and Lemonster and Lunenburg, and then sharing with, you know, mayors and, and the governor's office. And I think our region has done really well. I, I think by our very nature, we're collaborative. Uh, we realize that uh, we're not as densely populated as, uh, as the greater Be Boston metro area. Uh, we don't have the same legislative numbers. Um, so we don't necessarily always command that same uh, uh, authority in Boston. So that's necessitated these close working relationships uh, and collaborations between our communities instead of just relying on our own in, uh, selves. And I think as a result, uh, that too extends into sharing of resources and information at times like this. Uh, so I think our, we, we uh, resorted to something we know well, which is that, that collaboration, that communication uh, between municipalities. Um, and I think you're right. I think ultimately that uh, those, those fast actions by our local officials saved lives. Um, sort of on a similar note, uh, you have a long list of endorsements recently. You've got uh, Mayor Di Natale, Stephen Hay, 
Neville Hittens. I think Jim McGovern was added to that list recently. I um, think he was. I was honored to have the, the congressman's endorsement. Uh, and one of the ones that interested me was, uh, I might be getting the name wrong, the American Federation of Teachers in Massachusetts was among yes, them. Yes. And that, uh, that made me think, how are you, if you are elected a state representative, how are you going to prioritize education? How are you going to help fund and take care of education and children? Yeah, so education is one of our one of our top priorities in this campaign, uh, and and absolutely honored and thrilled to have uh, both the American Federation of Teachers and the Mass Teachers Association, um, uh, who have who have both endorsed uh, me and my campaign. Uh, and so, you know, for me, when we talk about education, I think most people think your your typical kindergarten, your your K uh, through twelve system. Um, and you know, looking at kind of the traditional educational approach, and that is absolutely essential. You know, uh, uh, the state rep in in um, uh, in Lemister, Natalie Higgins, and um, and Stephen Hay, uh, the representative of Fitchburg and Lunenburg, they worked very closely to ensure that we change the foundation funding formula and the student opportunities act um, uh, was uh, was successfully voted on and approved. To ensure that that critical funding to our K through 12 system um, happened, uh, that was a landmark uh, piece of legislation and funding, uh, and and that's wonderful. Uh, there's still a lot of gaps there that we need to address. Uh, we need to ensure that the funding actually hits the districts. But then, when you look beyond it, there's actually critical needs on, on both ends of that K through 12, which is you know early childhood education. Uh, we know that uh, there are. Uh, uh, there's overwhelming need for early childhood education. There's very few providers in this area. We can't actually meet the demand that there is. So you, in some sense, we're not quite a desert of early childhood education, um, but we're in an area where it's, where it's threatened. Not everyone has access to it, and certainly not everyone can afford it. Uh, and, I, and I believe we really need to move towards a model of, of universal early childhood education. Uh, and that's, we know studies have shown time and time again through, uh, through states and through countries that fund early childhood education, that you um, exponentially improve the development of a child um, uh, and uh, they, can, they can read earlier on, their critical assessment skills improve, um, and it, it's, it's a lifetime worth of impact for those couple of years of education. Uh, but we also know that there's there's far-reaching implications on our economy. If if there's early childhood education and we're able to get uh, young children uh, in some sort of uh, early childhood care and education environments, that allows parents and empowers parents to be able to go back to the workforce. Ultimately, that helps our economy. That means you're taking you know a large subsection of of parents um, and and empowering them to go back uh, and to be able to work. Uh, either part or full time, and uh, th that's that's critical, particularly for a region like ours. Uh, and what it also does too is uh, is secondarily of we we know unfortunately when when parents stay at home to provide care to their child, it's it's disproportionately uh, affects women. You know more often than not, it's it's uh, mothers, and that's changing. And and I'm very pleased to hear that it's changing, but it's not happening dramatically or or or, or quickly. Um, and it, so often what we see is that um, that uh, really detrimentally impacts the gender pay gap. Uh, and, you know, that that exacerbates the issues that we have of where women are making a fraction of what what men make. And I think in part that's because we don't have a strong and robust early childhood education that's accessible to everyone. So I look at um, early childhood as a huge piece uh, that affects not only education, but affects the economy uh, and affects um, the gender pay gap. I also look at higher education and workforce training. You know, Massachusetts is home to some of the best higher ed institutions uh, in the world. Our public education system is phenomenal, uh, but we're underfunding. Today, we spend less per student uh, in just actual dollars, not adjusted against inflation. We spend less, we spend almost 30% less today than we spent uh, in the year 2000. You adjust that against inflation, and I would challenge you, we spend less than 50% um, uh, today than we spent two decades ago. Uh, that is a travesty. Uh, for, for a state that prides itself on being one of the intellectual capitals of the world, we are systematically failing and fundamentally failing our, um, 
our, our higher education students and the families of this Commonwealth and the workforce of this Commonwealth. The economy thrives uh, on highly talented and skilled um, uh, workforce labor uh, that comes out of these higher ed institutions like Fitchburg State University, our UMass system, and our community colleges. Um, but at the same time, we also know that college isn't for everyone. And uh, ensuring that whether it's uh, job training programs like those provided through Mount Wachusett Community Colleges, or um, or you know uh, Monty Tech uh, in in trade schools, ensuring that we have um, uh, a strong pipeline and uh, affordable pipeline for folks to be able to learn and develop skills and trades that if they choose not to go to to college, uh, that they can enter the workforce at age 18 or 19 and uh, not only make a living wage. Uh, but be a contributing member of, of the, the Commonwealth's economy. Absolutely. And something else that related to this that came to light during the pandemic was just how many children rely on the school system and going to school for food and for being able to get like fresh food. But obviously that hasn't necessarily been available to them. Um, so I was wondering if you had any ideas on how we can make sure children are being properly fed and aren't relying too heavily on schools in case there is a situation like this in which they can't go to school? Well, you know, I, I think we're fortunate in Fitchburg that uh, at, at the outset of the pandemic, our schools immediately mobilized and really became centers of, of uh, food distribution uh, to our, our children and our families in need, ensuring that those children who do rely on one, two, or maybe even three meals a day uh, through our school system uh, don't suffer, excuse me, don't suffer uh, as a result. So um, they, uh, they really became these food distribution nodes uh, in our neighborhoods, in our community. Um, and uh, we used some of our busing contracts and certainly our food contracts to ensure that we were able to meet those obligations of you know, making the food, distributing the food, and even being able to disperse food to those um, you know, over the weekend. So some additional um, non-perishable goods or, or uh, long-lasting goods that can last um, those children through the weekends. Uh, so that's critical, but you're right. Food instability is a major issue uh, in our Commonwealth. Um, it, it's sadly uh, increasing um, and uh, in its prevalence, and there's just a lot that we need to do there uh, it, from both ensuring that we have the proper assistance um, for, for those families but also we need to destigmatize this. I was a kid who grew up on uh, free and at times, you know, reduced lunch. And I remember they, they would often, you know, they charge you 40 cents and every other kid had, you know, whatever, $2 bill, you know, that's, that's what your know, food was when I was in high school. And you pull out the 40 cents and the change, you know, jingling around as you put the change in the, the person's hand. And it was, uh, it was a really kind of demeaning and kids would make fun of you and look at you funny because, you know, you were less than them in their eyes. And it became yet another way of separating the us versus the them. And, you know, I talked earlier about ensuring that everyone has that same, that level playing field, particularly as children. That's one of those easy areas, you know, uh, everyone in our school systems and everyone of school age should, uh, should be able to, to eat quality meals and it shouldn't just be a meal. It shouldn't just be prepackaged, non-perishable goods. Um, they deserve to, to have a healthy, nutritious meal each and every day, um, you know, and three meals of them a day. And so that's crucial. And I think that's one of those gaps that we need to address. Um, and I think there's, there's been some steps taken, but I think we have a long way to go to make sure that um, no child in our Commonwealth goes without nutritious, uh, regular meals. Absolutely. And, um... Something I noticed on your website, uh, I did a little bit of research. Uh, you mentioned improvements that need to be made towards infrastructure in the area and some of the more, some of the crumbling I infrastructure. Uh, what exactly do you plan on doing as state rep to fix like roads and buildings and stuff like that to make sure it's all safe? Yeah, so th there's, um, you know, let's be honest here. If people in Fitchburg, it's no surprise when I say our infrastructure and our roads just aren't good, right? And it, it's not a disservice to the people that work uh, on our roads. Our, our public works departments uh, does incredible work with the resources that they're given, but that's really it. That 
that we're talking about resources. So the funding that we get from the state, um, you know, the, the, the chapter 90 funds are, are really, you know, on a good year, it amounts to about 1.4 million, which sounds like a ton of money, you know, to, to you and I, 1.4 million, I, I, I could do a lot with that. Unfortunately, you know, it paves on a good year, two miles worth of road and maybe gets us, you know, a tenth of a mile of some, uh, some concrete sidewalks. We have 220 miles of public and private road in our city. You know, at that rate, we're really talking about the once every hundred years we can pave every road in the city. That's just inadequate. Um, you know, uh, towns in central Massachusetts and cities in central Massachusetts have some of the largest land mass and some of the, the largest networks of roads in the, in the Commonwealth. Um, but yet we don't receive that comparable funding. So I think we need to look at the funding formula for how infrastructure support um, is given to cities, towns, and municipalities. Uh, we need to look at, um, you know, it, it, the cities were never set up to be able to deal with the level and the magnitude of these of infrastructure maintenance and repair. And often the state will build it and they'll turn it over to the city and then it's our problem to deal with it and maintaining it, whether it's bridges, roads, and dams. Um, well, we need the state to continue to, to help us there. Uh, but then also, I think we need, to, we need to tackle our infrastructure issue, both at the federal and the state level. I can't address the federal issue um, if I'm fortunate enough in November, but I can look at this, the, the state issue, and I think we need to look at an infrastructure spending bill um, for our roads um, and infrastructure. But we also need to look at you know, public transportation as well. We need to you know, ease the reliance on, on roads, which, you know, so we need to bridge the currents with the future, fix the roads that we have and the bridges that we have, but we also need to look at investing in public transportation from, you know, uh, busing, uh, electrifying our, you know, our commuter rail, uh, cutting down the commute times, making it easier uh, and more accessible, and also increasing the, the, uh, the network of commuter rail and trains. Um, it's really, it's really deplorable uh, that, you know, uh, we, we have we have mass uh, transportation systems that are 30, 40, 50, 60 years old at times uh, and, uh, you know, barely operating when it's cold. And we know it gets cold in New England, um, you know, when it drops below uh, 30 or 20 degrees and all of a sudden our trains stop working. We need to tackle those issues, too. And so I think infrastructure is the one thing that Democrats and Republicans alike should be able to get on board with. Um, this shouldn't be a partisan issue. It's it's just uh, it's going to take some political will, but I think we need to get it done. Absolutely. And um, I guess speaking of a little bit more of a political issue, uh, you both agree that education is very important. But you know, when you own the school, in the past five-ish years or so, as a student myself, I've noticed that I've been following the news and I realized school shootings are far more common than they should be, and they're just a real fear that a lot of students have. So. As a state representative, do you have any like plans you'd want to make to try and cut back on that stuff, like gun control, things like that, to really lower those numbers? Yeah. So I think uh, you know certainly we need to do a better job on on school safety um, and both at a national level and a state level, and, and which then in turn trickles down to to local. Uh, you know, I think uh, we need to look at all of the above in terms of solutions. I think. You know, I've heard a lot of talks right now, and, and, you know, unfortunately, I hear talks about, you know, removing school resource officers, you know, the police officers who are embedded in our schools. I, th I think th those are critical aspects of uh, ensuring safety in our schools. So I think, um, you know, beyond all the conversations around police reform, I think we need to make sure that we're able to maintain and sustain, uh, you know, school resource officers uh, in places like Pittsburgh. We've talked about increasing the numbers. Um, uh, in our school uh, as both community relations impact on our school, but also the, the, the physical safety aspect, right? Um, but I think we also need to take a look at, you know, there's, there's innovative solutions. There's a company in, um, in, in Fitchburg that's working on, um, you know, changing, you know, creating special locks uh, for teachers that in the case of a mass shooting, you know, those, uh, those locks can be used that keep the door from pretty much no matter what being broken down or shot through um, so, so that the uh, a shooter can't get into the classroom. So we need to look at, you know, basic infrastructure improvements to our schools uh, that can help uh, reduce the threat uh, if, if such a situation were to happen. 
but then also then then we get into the societal issue of you know do we need you know we we need universal background checks um you know that's uh, that's essential uh and i think you know i think we need to look at all of the options to ensure that you know um th that we're keeping guns out of schools uh and uh, that we're keeping our school children safe absolutely and um I guess this is uh, why the show is called The Vetting Process. I think we have a little bit of a disagreement here um, uh, about uh, the use of school resource officers. I think, of course, they are important. Of course, I think police are important in enforcing law. But I've been of the opinion, as of more recently, that perhaps peeling back the idea of school resource officers and putting that funding towards things like, like mental health work in school to make sure students, make sure it never gets to the point where we need a police officer precautionary measure as opposed to when it does happen we have an officer on site yeah I, and i think i, I certainly understand I, my wife's a social worker i you know I, I place an incredible value on social workers uh and human services workers uh across the spectrum you know from our schools through our elderly community uh and what i what i don't like right now is that we're hearing often it's it's a um uh social workers and human services workers at the expense of police and i think if you talk to law enforcement they'll they'll be the first to say they want more social workers in the community i want more social workers in the community i want them to be better paid as well uh, and better resourced uh we don't have enough social workers in the commonwealth to actually meet the demands that's a whole other issue um but that's in due, due in part because we're not funding uh, social workers properly either um and placing a high enough emphasis on the work that they do you're absolutely right I don't think we need to choose one or the other. Um, and I think it's, I talked earlier about, you know, infrastructure, right? You need to address the, the, the issue at your hands, which is, yes, we, we have a safety issue in our schools. We have a safety issue in our society. There are, there are people out there um, that have guns already um, and in our communities, whether or not we like it or not, it, it, it's, it's there. And so I think the school resource officers that help address some of that immediate the safety issue upon us today. At the same time, you're right. I think we need to have more um, more social workers in our schools uh, working preventatively um, to tackle mental health issues. Uh, police aren't equipped to deal with mental health issues. You know, they might be able to deal with the short-term crisis um, when it's when it's upon them, but that's not what they're trained to do. That's what a social worker is trained to do, though, is to intervene in these mental health crisis situations. And so, I think. I think there's a need for both. And um, so I, I think uh, social workers are an incredible part um, of this solution moving forward uh, around crime, around social equity. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I just look at it and say, we don't have to choose one or the other. I think we need to make a commitment to both. Absolutely. And so they're talking about like the police side of things, like, well, like not necessarily in schools, but perhaps in schools and just overall in a citywide level. Uh, what do you think about the idea of like, like jailing has always been a, a little bit of like, a, like it's always like a punishment sort of situation. But what do you think about like the idea of jailing itself turning more into a rehabilitation thing, rehabilitating criminals as opposed to locking them up in cells and such? Yeah. So, and I, I studied criminal justice and the conversation around uh, around jails and imprisonments uh, were always about is the idea of retribution or is it rehabilitation? And and certainly I think in Massachusetts we accept and embrace it is it is supposed to be rehabilitation the idea is being able to reintroduce people back into society to be productive members of society uh and to help them um to, to help them uh and to give them the resources necessary to to, to reintroduce them uh and, and i think the criminal justice reform bill that passed in 2017 and uh and in some cases things are slow to roll out in other other cases they were really you know um you know we started seeing some dramatic impacts but i think looking at you're right folks that are arrested um you know for for use of drugs of uh, you know they're addicts they're often victims um of a whole series of other unfortunate events or crimes and you know how how do we ensure that they don't end up in prison as a punitive punishment for what is largely seen as a mental health you know and an addiction scenario so i i think you're right we need to be creative in how we look at rehabilitation um you know uh there are certainly times where jails and prisons are needed and warranted in these situations but i think wherever possible we need to look at rehabilitation and look at how, how do we 
um, help the individual, um, you know, wherever we can bypass sending someone, uh, wherever we can keep them in the community with their children and their families. We know that's, that's a, a great secondary effect to their family, but it's a great effect for them. Family is some of the, uh, you know, family and creating a support system for an individual is often far more effective um, than, than punishing them. Um, but again, we need to make sure we need to balance that. Are they, a, are they safe to themselves and to others? Um, and how can we do this effectively? Uh, but we know that there's a, you know, um, we know that there's a massive net benefit uh, to our, our budgets, our communities, um, and those individuals where we, where we choose to rehabilitate uh, and can do it um, through, uh, uh, through preventative means. Uh, before they enter the criminal justice system. Absolutely. And uh, on a bit of an unrelated note, question I have here, uh, the fair share amendment and that idea was something that was introduced to recently, which is essentially placing, I believe the number is 4% right now, with a little bit of a, of a percentage of a tax on income over $1 million and the money taken from that would go towards paying stuff like education, transportation, road work. Where, where do you stand on that idea? Yeah, I, I don't take raising taxes lightly, you know, um, uh, for for anyone or for anything. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I am in favor of it. Um, and I, I think it creates both a revenue uh, source that can really help to tackle some of our uh, societal disparities. Um, and we also know many of these individuals making over a million dollars annually are, are um, they're, they're benefiting disproportionately to the rest of the Commonwealth. And uh, they're, they're benefiting from, you know, our infrastructure systems, our education systems, um, what have you, uh, at, a, at a rates that others are not benefiting from. And so I, I don't think it's unfair to look at, um, you know, uh, progressive ways of, of taxing um, that, uh, that can then pay back into the system. I want them to make money. I want people to be millionaires. I want them to be fabulously successful in our commonwealth. I want them to pay their fair share. And my hope is that with the money that we get from that, we can reinvest in those systems so they can continue to make a whole lot more money. Um, and, and that helps perpetuate, you know, um, a, a healthy economic cycle um, and, and social mobility in the commonwealth. Absolutely. And, um, Especially for a political figure, you are rather young, which kind of leads into two questions I have here. How do you plan on encouraging young people to like to go out and vote and to be active in their community and especially in like politics? Is, is that's always sort of like treated as like a boring issue or a controversial issue? How do you get young people to be more active in that? Uh, yeah, it's a, a great question. Um, I, and I don't know that there's any uh, uh, silver bullet or, or easy answer here. You know, I, I'm, you're right. I, I, I'm young. I'm, I'm 33. I'm used to being the youngest person in almost every room that I'm in, whether it's in my, uh, my career in higher education, um, usually the youngest director sitting around a table, um, uh, as a city councilor, uh, when I was elected, I was the youngest city councilor at the table and I'm the youngest city council president, <laughs> I, I believe in the history of the city. Um, and you know, it's both something I, I wear as a badge of honor, but I also recognize that it's a sad thing that our city has been around for 250 years and there's never been someone younger than 27 that's been a city council president. Uh, and I believe at 33, I may still be the youngest in the history. Um, and so, you know, we need to do a lot of work to encourage um, young people to be involved and to see the benefit in local politics. So I, I think we can do it from a few different ways. One, uh, politicians are often focused and elected officials are often focused. Um, and, and it's not a slight against them. They're focused on the people that can vote for them. And, the, you know, and so I think as a result, they're, they're predisposed to focusing on, you know, uh, uh, people not only at 18 plus, but they're focused on people who are inclined to vote, right? Or most likely to vote. Um, and instead i think we need to shift some of that model as well and we need to we need to spend more time in our middle schools and in our high schools talking about the role of local government and there's incredibly impactful things that happen in our city treasurer's office and assessor's office and in our fire and police departments and our board of health 
we should be interning people. We should be having someone from middle school and from high school in every department every summer um, as, as a paid internship and really exposing not only our, our youths in our city, but also their families and their communities. Uh, and I look at it and say, let's go one step further. Let's, let's target young people of color um, and, and diversity and invite them in and, and invite them into the halls of government and give them an intern, a paid internship. Um, and we can both inspire um, uh, them to public service. We can, um, we can help fill some of that knowledge gap about what it is that gets done in the halls of government. Um, and, you know, I think the other piece is for, for the elected officials, because I, you know, I, I think we own a part of this too. We need to be more accessible. We can't, you know, typically we'll, we'll jump in front of a, a stage and a microphone or a camera wherever we can, right? Often those stages and those cameras are, are held by folks that are, you know, likely voters or, or broadcasting the, the likely voters. We need to think about those who are aspirational voters. Um, you know, those who want to vote, but don't yet have that right. But, but let's, let's give them that opportunity. Let's talk to them early and often and uh, let's encourage them to be a part of this, um, this system. And so I, I think we own a part of that, uh, a huge part of that. And so, you know, uh, again, I, I started before, I think we started recording I, by applauding you for, uh, you, you're 14 years old, is that correct? Uh, yes. So, I mean, it, it, that's just remarkable that someone your age uh, cares enough about politics to do. Um, uh, a show called The Vetting Process. I, I was, uh, when my campaign manager, Brandon, brought this to me, I, I was thrilled to, to hear about it and, um, and delighted to do it. I'm, I'll make that commitment of, you know, you want to have me in once a year, let's continue to do this. Uh, and you have other friends that want to do this kind of thing, whether it's podcasting or, or, or a video interview, let's do it. Um, and I think we need to make that commitment. And my commitment isn't just to you, it's to that next generation of aspiring um, uh, voters and aspiring uh, political officials, uh, we need to make ourselves accessible and we need to be a part of that solution. Yeah, and Brandon was the one who, uh, I watched one of your live events, I think a month or so back, you did a Facebook live event and Brandon was the one who introduced me to that, who introduced me to you as a candidate. And, you know, I I don't follow politics much outside of Lemon, sir, unfortunately, that's, but like to hear like a young candidate talking about the issues that really matter. I think that's such an important thing to, to talk about and like to try and push as far as possible. And um, the next question I have here is as a politician who is so young and who is slowly climbing the ranks, you know, you're up to running for state representative now. This perhaps is a little bit early to ask this, but do you have aspirations for higher office after state rep? You know, I, I am, uh, I am just, so excited for this opportunity I have in front of me. I can't, you know, honestly think about any next steps beyond, you know, any step beyond that of the, um, this is a dream come true for me. Uh, and, and I see running for state rep as a once in a lifetime opportunity of, uh, you know, I, I shared with you earlier that, you know, this is far from a foregone conclusion, but I never in my wildest dreams, you know, at, at your age thought I'd be doing something like what I'm doing now. I not only um, didn't know that it was possible, um, I, I really just didn't think I'd have the opportunities um, or be in a place in my life to be able to do something like that. So uh, every day, uh, you know, every day on this campaign trail so far has been like waking up and I'm excited to go. Let's get my cup of coffee. Let's get back to work. And I go to bed at night thinking I'm excited to wake up the next day and get back to work at this. And um, that's been truly refreshing of, I know this is what I want to be doing. I'm, uh, I'm excited uh, each and every day uh, and I'm challenged in new ways. And, and I love that aspect of it. And you said earlier, you know, we don't agree, you know, we don't always see eye to eye on the same issue. I love that because that means we need to talk more and I'm not always going to be right. You're not always going to be right. No one's always going to be right all the time, but it challenges us to think and to learn uh, differently. And, uh, and that invigorates me. Yeah. yeah. Even John McCain didn't always, in my opinion, have the greatest views, but he still did amazing things. Absolutely. Uh, and so to wrap up this interview, uh, 
I have uh, the, a little bit of a lightning round. So I have uh, eight topics here. And uh, in around two sentences or less, I want uh, your quick views on those issues. Uh, issue number one, climate change. Sure. I, 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 don't, I go one step further. I call it climate emergency. Uh, the time to act is now. Um, the house is on fire. How do we react? How do we respond? What we do right now uh, will shape uh, not only the next generation, that's a convenient excuse is to say it affects the next generation, it affects this generation right now. Uh, topic number two, woman's right to choose. Yeah, I, I, I'm unapologetically uh, in favor of uh, protecting and expanding um, the women's uh, access to, to health care and reproductive rights and family planning. Uh, it's an area I truly feel passionate about uh, uh, that, is, that is not up uh, to a man to decide, that is not up to a legislature to decide. It is, it is uh, women's right to choose. Absolutely. Uh, topic number three, immigration. Yeah, I I, um, I I think part of what makes Pittsburgh great is its diverse tapestry of cultures and ethnicities um, and viewpoints, and uh, immigration has been a huge part of um, of that. Um, and so I see immigrants and immigration as bringing new ideas and viewpoints and cultures um, to our communities and to our Commonwealth, and I think that's a net positive. Um, and you know, so I think we need to encourage uh, immigration, we need to destigmatize immigration, uh, and we need to support those immigrants who choose to uproot their lives and, and come. You know, we all talk about it. It's a land of dream and opportunity. Well, not if we stigmatize um, and, uh, and, and demean. So we need to encourage uh, and to respect and to celebrate those who make the decision to come to America and, and particularly to North Central Massachusetts. Topic number four, something we talked about a little bit before, policing reform. Yeah, I, I think this is a chance for a once in a generation uh, reform uh, and change in our society. Uh, it's needed, it's wanted, uh, and it's deserved. We need to do our due diligence. I don't want to see us reacting in two weeks time or four weeks time uh, to something that needs to be um, needs to be carefully thought out, um, and so I, I think there's some elements of this police reform bill that are incredibly beneficial. Uh, the uh, um, uh, the certification, decertification, the post standards, wonderful uh, banning chokeholds and uh, restricting use of tear gas um, and, and and the discharge of firearms and fleeing individuals and vehicles. Incredible change. Uh, you know, the additional pieces of the bill, I just want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence. But again, once in a lifetime and generational change, uh, the time is upon us. Um, let's do it and let's do it right. Absolutely. Uh, and sort of in a similar vein, the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, I, I you know, I believe that, that Black Lives Matter. And, you know, and I truly believe that all lives can't matter until we acknowledge and believe that black and brown lives matter just as much um, as anyone else's life. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been heartbreaking to see what's happening and unfolding, um, you know, across our country. Um, we can do better. We need to do better. Um, and, and the time to acknowledge uh, this is now. And so um, it's, I, as heartbreaking as it's been, I see a lot of optimism and reasons for hope and, and prosperity in the future for everyone. Okay, uh, issue number seven, universal health care. Yeah, I, so this is one of those where uh, I I look ahead and say, yes, that's the salute, that's the long-term solution is universal um, health care for all. I, there are systems that work, and in fact, most of those systems work. We spend more per capita in this country and in this commonwealth on health care than any other um, first world nation on earth and really any other uh, nation on earth. And um, we have the best healthcare institutions uh, on earth in our own commonwealth. And we have the best institutions that teach medicine on earth in our commonwealth, yet our system is far from perfect. Um, we passed Romney care uh, back in the early 2000s. We patted ourselves on the back and we haven't done enough since. We owe our residents and our citizens of the Commonwealth so much more in terms of affordability and access to healthcare. Um, 
And I think, in fact, in many ways, we've gone the opposite direction. So in the short term, we need to address uh, those glaring uh, disparities between access and affordability in the Commonwealth. And I think ultimately we need to move towards a long-term solution of universal health care for everyone. Absolutely. And uh, this is possibly the hardest question I've asked you all in the view. Uh, which is the best flavor of ice cream? Uh, yeah, I, this uh, is indeed, this was agonizing actually. So I saw your previous interview uh, and, and I wrote down like six different flavors uh, and I have a hard time choosing between them. Uh, but I'm going to go with my, my gut instinct with pistachio. Um, uh, yeah, I, it's, uh, it's an odd choice, but, uh, but one that I grew up with and one that I love. That's a good choice. Well, I think that's all the questions I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on. This, is, this has been great. Josh, it's a, a pleasure. I commend you for what you're doing. Keep at it. And I will make that commitment of uh, I'd love to come back and, and do this again. Absolutely. Well, I think, uh, and have a great all. day.